So welcome everybody to our webinar today, bringing your business advisory and funding capital advisory services together. So a great session that we got planned uh, and let's get straight in. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ainsley Damery. I'm the CEO of Clarity. I am also a chartered accountant. I recently handed back my practicing certificate. So when I mention us as accountants and we as accountants, I'm kind of referring to the collective we. So apologies if you take offense to that. Uh, but I have been an accountant for uh, many uh, years. Uh, having left KPMG, I built and sold my own accounting firm. Uh, we were very early adopters of cloud technology, heavily into niche business advisory for high growth entrepreneurs and won a huge number of awards. I uh, left KP, uh, uh, left Tab Ali Tomlin and sold that to focus a bit more on clarity. Ollie, do you want to introduce yourself and we'll get to a little bit about Capitalize in a sec. Sure. Um, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Ollie Cummings, the commercial director at Capitalize and, and one of the early people who started the business. Um, I'm also an accountant. Um, I started life as an auditor at EY in London um, and then was in corporate finance for many, maybe 10, 10 or so years um, before I, I jumped, jumped ship from the profession and helped build a peer-to-peer -peer lender called Market Invoice, now Market Finance. Um, and then really saw the the kind of gap of what Capitalize do now while I was while I was there, um, and then since then have been helping to build Capitalize from uh, kind of no funding all the way to through three rounds and past Series A. So we are um, yeah, that's that's me. Excellent. So you're going to bring some good uh, experience from the accounting world and funding together and to funding to, well. and funding to be able to show how we can really. Uh, get this done easily and and deliver a profitable service line too. Yes. Cool. Kelly, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself too? Yeah, so uh, I'm Kelly Hurst. I am not an accountant, um, so I'm slightly different to, um, <laughs> to Ollie and Ainsley, but uh, I'm Senior Business Development Manager here at Clarity, so I um, help uh, all of the uh, accountancy firms that are looking at joining Clarity uh, I came from QuickBooks, that my history is helping accountants um, for the last few years. And then before that, I was actually at Sage for six and a half years. So I've worked in the industry for quite a while. And, um, and yeah, so that is me. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kelly. Ollie, you're wearing green today. That's good. Thank you very much. Very proud. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Capitalize? Yes, sure. Um, happy to. Um, so Capitalize, we're a... Um, so it's a ready-made capital advisory service. We're all about looking beyond the numbers to help strengthen your clients' balance sheets. And, and the whole idea there is to build resilience in your clients by helping them raise, recover, and protect all through one platform. Um, so we started in purely funding, and we've already raised over three quarters of a billion pounds worth of funding for UK SMEs, purely through accountants and accountancy firms. Um, and we've also recently expanded our offering so we've got over 130 plus uh, lenders and capital service providers. Um, and what that means is we can help you raise capital through funding that's secured and property lending, bank lending, um, alternative lenders, the whole, the whole group of fintechs, um, and also C-bills. And, and now also we, also, we do grants as well. So that's the way we can raise recover, raise capital. We can actually help you recover capital now, which is looking at... Um, debt recovery um, and late payments and dispute management and now R&D tax credits and actually help you protect capital through our credit improvement services. And so we've recently launched our um, product to help you discover those capital cases within your firm. And I've just thought it'd be quite interesting to, to show from our connected clients so far, we've actually found that 21% of them are eligible for uh, C-bills, which is coronavirus loans. 40% uh, of them um, have a credit score of C or below, so could definitely do improvement there. 37% of them have unmet liabilities within there, um, which is very similar to your core, your core cash target, which is, is, which is really interesting. And 39% have late payments or bad debts that should be recovered. Um, so some quite interesting stats from us. We also have a CBT accredited education service um, with a dedicated team of customer success and in-house training. Um, and we've also got three online courses. So in a nutshell, 
we can help you get cash into your business um, as many ways as we can find to help you. Um, and that's Capital Advisory. And as we're about to go in, it sits wonderfully with um, the Clarity HQ solution of Business Advisory. Fantastic. Thank you, Ollie. Now, just to let everybody know, we're all very pre relaxed presenters on here. So please, if you do have any questions, just fire in the chat box um, and we will get to them. If you want to send them to Q&A, it's a little bit easier for us because then we can, we can track what we've answered and what we haven't answered. Sometimes they can get a little bit lost in chat. If you want to chat in chat amongst yourselves, then that's great. But if you want to ask a question, if you could use the Q&A box, that would be a little bit easier for us to be able to keep on track of the questions that are coming in. Now, Carol did raise a question, Ollie, straight away. So as it's relevant from what you've just been discussing, I will yep. fire into it straight away. Uh, do you set up EISs? I have a client in the film industry who wants investment. Ah, so I used to set up EIS schemes and the film industry was one of the most rife parts of the EIS scheme. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't set up uh, EIS schemes. We, we, we have looked into it, <coughs> but it's, it's very much a skill set within the accountancy firm um, rather than external. But it's something we can definitely look at. Um, I, it's, it's been done in the past when I was in corporate finance. Um, I did two or three of those um in 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 my then in, in fact one of them was with entertainment one which is which has done increasingly well since that happened <laughs> wish i was allowed to go into that one <laughs> fair um, enough and, and i have set up yeah sorry Ollie. Oh, yeah i was gonna say ainsley might be your man your 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 man for that yeah i mean i have set up three schemes not not too many but i have set up three so if you do want uh carol to ask me some questions they are I suppose from an accounting perspective, it's a lot of form filling, but it's not that crazy a, a setup to do. Um, but if you're looking for EIS investment, that's a very different matter if you're looking for funds to invest in. Great. Uh, yes. Good point. So do you have EIS funds on your, when you, with your capital? Not yet. Uh, not yet. The, at this moment, we've, we've avoided equity um, just because of the, the complications of the, of the market and the wide amount and the very kind of low low success rates with equity. Um, but if you, you know, happy to have a private conversation on that because it's, it's quite a big subject. <laughs> okay, thanks, Carol. If you could use the Q&A, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yes, I got that. That's an, uh, yeah, uh, as an accountant, I think we can guide you through that one for a small fee. Yeah, no problem. Kelly, do you want to introduce uh, Clarity? Yes, so a little bit about Clarity. I can see that we've um, already got a few uh, Clarity members on here so that's um, amazing. Um, so a little bit about Clarity if um, you're new to Clarity is that we are a business advisory platform but we leverage the technology to provide you with a, a systemized way of scaling your uh, advisory services for your clients. Um, so we help you look at your whole client base rather than just that top 10% that uh, you're currently serving or that needs that sort of complex advisory consultancy. This um, allows you to, to broaden out to your whole client base, but also to not bottleneck the advisory services at the partners or the, um, the managing partners. So it means that you can broaden that out to your whole um, senior management team or your junior members of the team so that everyone can have an element of uh, advisory services to, uh, to your uh, your clients. So we are all about making the complex world of business beautifully simple, as it states there, um, and empowering small businesses. We're, we're very much um, passionate about small business, and we know that accountants are the ones that are going to bring back the economy by helping small businesses. So we want to provide a system and a process that is very um, easy to follow, uh, but is going to provide as much um, sort of uh, relevance for your clients to for them to, to build their their businesses up as well. Fab, thank you, Kelly. So as it says, the quality being transparent, coherent, coherent and intelligible for your clients, effectively. Super. Um, okay, cracking on with the the agenda and what we're going to cover today. So thanks very much, guys, for for the brief intros. What we want to, I suppose, basically start the conversation on why business and capital, by business advisory and capital advisory are so inextricably linked, uh, why they're peas out of a pot, fish and chips, gin and tonic, I think was some of the phrases that have been used. And so why that's the case and why it's important that we bring both services together. 
We're going to take you through in this session, we're going to be looking at business advisory. Remember, this is part one of a two-part series. The next session is going to be focusing on the capital advisory. So how do you introduce and scale and deliver a capital advisory service in your accounting firm? Today, we're focusing on the business advisory side. Ollie's going to touch into a really topical point at the moment, and uh, it's hot topic at the moment. Uh, it's effectively, I'm not going to steal his thunder, but we're going to be basically saying recovery loans are not the same as Siebel's. Do not be lulled into a false sense of security. 31st of March is a big deadline. So please be focused on that 31st of March and make sure you help your clients before the 31st of March. Ollie's unmuted, so he's probably just going to chip in there. Oh, no, I, I, I just say, I'll, I'll, save, I'll save it till the end so you can... Uh... You can uh, ask as many C bills slash recovery loans questions as you want when I've uh, talked to you guys through it. Good. So I think there's going to be quite a few questions on there, Ollie, to cover. And the last is we're going to give you a, a, obviously a clear open session to ask any uh, questions you've got so far. And Ollie's going to introduce session two and tell you what's coming in that next session as well. So let's crack on, shall we? Business advisory and capital advisory. Kelly, what have you got to say? So, yeah, I love these analogies of uh, the fish and chips and the gin and tonic, um, uh, Ant and Deck, like in um, to bring in the, uh, the the Newcastle vibe. But um, so, yeah, it's, it's all about how your business advisory and capital advisory, they have they have to go together. So these analogies are two things that you would always put together because you can't look at advising a business on how they're going to grow, uh, what they're going to do, what the growth is going to be without looking at how they're going to fund that growth. They need to be able to understand the ways that they're going to fund that and what is available to them to be able to fund that growth. Um, and then the other way around is if they have got the funding and they, they ha have that funding, they need to be able to have a plan in place to utilise that funding in the best possible way. Uh, so that, that that is where these double act analogies come from because they, they do go together. And when you think of one, you, you have to think of them, um, have to think of the other. And Fab, thank you, Kelly. Ollie, what, what so, do you reckon? Yeah. Oh, and so, by the way, are, are you, is Capitalize the gin or the tonic? Or the fish <laughs> or the chips? Can we be the gin? <laughs> <laughs> you can, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> or seed lip if you're, you know, if you're not yeah, drinking. Okay. Um, so, so what capital services really means is getting cash into the business at that moment by as many possible ways as you can. It interests me based on the equity question. Um, I, I worked in the venture capital space for a, a little a little time and, and actually realized the numbers of firms getting equity funding was, that, was tiny compared to the amount of people that build their businesses through debt. And that was really what brought me into the, the debt space afterwards. Um, but... So if you imagine our service, what Capital Advisory is getting cash into the business at the time of need or at the time of uh, potential, at the time of opportunity, when what the Clarity Service of Business Advisory is doing is it's working with your clients to find those times of need, find those times of opportunity, those times of, you know, there could be some times when you realize your working capital is not working. There must be ways you've got to get cash in now then you need to work out how to, to improve that. There could be a sudden opportunity, a new market. You use the capital platform to see what you need to get into that market. That brings you into capital and you now need some capital to go into that market. And, and that's what's so wonderful about the link between our two platforms is, is you can find the opportunity and then you fulfill the opportunity. And that's the opportunity for your client to get whatever they're needed to become a successful business. At, obviously at this time it might be whatever they need to stay a going concern to stay doing what they love doing and it's both are equally as important um, and that's why I think it's gin tonic as you say fish and chips all, all types of things that blend well um, it's it's finding the opportunity and it's filling that opportunity. Great thanks Ollie and from a practice perspective when you were in practice um, you know later on and, and, and more laterally you were in corporate finance did the two marry well together from a big four perspective or were they a little bit siloed? Oh, they were siloed beyond an inch of their lives. Um, and in fact, siloed literally by some audit files um, <laughs> because you, you, they decided to put a big, like all the audit files between the corporate finance team and the, um, and the, the audit and, and outsourcing teams. So it was like a kind of literal Chinese wall via audit files. And, and it's always what, 
when we first came to the market, the original the original idea I um, we had as c- capitalized was then we accountants must be doing more funding. They can do the corporate finance piece and they do um, everything within the restructuring piece. But what they didn't do was the everyday lending in between, which is 95% of the lending in the UK economy um, to SMEs. So actually intrinsically within firms, there can be a big gap between the actual kind of corporate finance part of the funding market and the restructuring part of the funding market in, in the middle, like everyday businesses doing their everyday um, kind of roles and services. And that's great for us, isn't it? Working nowadays with more dynamic, nimble, agile, flexible firms that are combining and doing more and doing more for their clients and doing it together. And that's why I think it's an exciting opportunity. Yeah. Because you can uncover now, those firms that you don't normally speak to, those your, your clients that you don't normally speak to um, by, by, you know, by clarity. And that opens up all these kind of conversations that you typically wouldn't have. And if you think about it for a firm, very simply, if you put 100 grand into a firm that's got 500 grand revenue, there's a whole set of things that they now want. They've just matured as a business. They've just gone to the next level as a business, looking for growth, looking for budgeting, looking for forecasting, and and they've matured. And you know that that firm has, that company um, wants to go places. And Ollie, you've got a great stat on the involvement of an accounting accountant in the whole funding process. What does that do to the chances of success for, for us, for the, for the small business owner? Sure. So we've, we've found from looking at our conversion um, metrics that without an accountant involved, because you add an accountant into the equation, it's four times more likely that that firm will get, that customer will get funding. Um, and that's because the accountant is a trusted person within this situation and therefore when the lender is making their um, underwriting decisions their risk decisions their kind of um, forecasting decisions they're confident there's a there's a sensible person in the room who knows knows the accounts knows the funding and is is part of the equation and that makes them more willing to lend to to clients so it really is it's just such a good thing for an accountant to be involved in the the fundraising process Excellent. Four times. That's whopping. whopping. Yeah, and we think it might be going even higher because we crunched that number a, a little back, a, a little while back, and we think we're actually it's going to be a lot bigger than that going forward. Interesting stats, Kelly. Were you going to hop in? No, I was just going to say how interesting that that stat is because that that's exactly what we um, always say is that uh, the accountants or the the trusted advisor they're the ones that the the businesses need, uh, and they're the ones that tr- they trust with their numbers. So. To hear stats like that is is really great. It, it's really interesting. In 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 the old days, kind of actually pre my career, um, around the eighties and early nineties, lenders would get accountants to do monthly or quarterly um, forecasts for them, and that would give them confidence that they could continue lending to that um, that client. So actually. In, in the 80s and 90s, accountants and lenders are really ingrained. Um, something seemed to separate during the late 90s and 2000s with the um, kind of the, the loss of bank managers and, and the loss of the close service between a high street bank and a small SME in the UK. And that was so that's a kind of really fascinating piece that hopefully, you know, as two platforms, we can really start bringing that connection back again. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Okay, let's let's uh, thank you for that, both of you. Let's crack into business advisory and what is business advisory and how do you go about delivering a business advisory service? Um, so as I said, this is part one of a two-part web series. The next one, we're going to be focusing on capital advisory. Now, they kind of go in a flow, not necessarily, because a client might come in with a, with a capital requirement or they might come in with a funding requirement and therefore you're going to need to do some work to be able to support that. But in the logical sequence, you should be talking to your clients on a proactive basis. So you should be within them and involved with them and understand in advance that they're going to need a funding, uh, that they've got a funding opportunity or they're going to need a a capital requirement as we go. So that's why we've taken them in this flow. So before we get into what is business advisory, let's look at some of the major challenges that are facing small businesses in the UK. So small businesses are huge. They represent 99.9% of all businesses in the UK, 5.9 million of them. 
They have nearly two thirds of private sector uh, employment, um, almost that's about 62%, and they are over half of private sector GDP. So small business is absolutely colossal, but the survival rates as we know as accountants are pretty woeful. In fact, five out of 10 businesses uh, fail within the first five years. And when we look out to that 10 year period, it's anywhere between one and three businesses survives that 10 year cycle. So if uh, we can help small business owners and understand what the issues and challenges we are as accountants, we have an amazing ability to be able to change that needle and to, to drive the economy forward. So uh, that's kind of our mantra from a, a business perspective, from a small business perspective, accountants have the superpowers to be able to help small businesses. So let's get that unleashed and get the economy going, particularly at this moment in time. We know there's a, a tough few months coming and potentially September time will be pretty tricky for many out there. So let's get into those challenges. The first one is business is complex. The world is complex. It's getting more so. Business owners are often said to be drowning in information and starving for knowledge. As accountants, we need to be giving them insights rather than flooding them with lots more information. So it's really important that we are there to crunch that data, to break that data down, to strip back the complexity, and to be able to give our business owners insights so that they can make better business decisions. The next big challenge, obviously, that we'll be talking about, and particularly uh, with what we're talking about now is cash. So startups don't have any. They need to borrow from friends and family, uh, credit cards, mom and dad, bank of mom and dad, or anywhere they can get money. And the rule and, and the, the, I suppose, the law of growing businesses, scaling businesses, just consume cash. And it's really interesting when we're looking at uh, growth and looking at businesses are th that are growing, their cash requirement and their need for cash generally goes uh, exponentially as they start to grow their businesses, as they become more successful, they need more cash and they need more access to cash. Now, as accountants, we obviously understand the difference between profit and cash. We understand the difference between operating cash, financing cash and investing cash. And we understand how important it is for a business to turn profit into, into operating cash. We also understand the movement of cash within the business and how small business owners can get access to the right cash at the right price, because this is what it's about too, getting access to the right type of finance at the right time for their business or the right source of capital to be able to propel that business forward. And as Ollie said, accountants involved in the equation are four times more likely to uh, obtain that funding. Well, it's not even that, it goes way beyond that, I think. It's about getting the right funding at the right time is really critical as well for that business and accountants have that in spades. The next one is numbers, not knowing your numbers, not understanding your numbers. Small business owners generally don't get numbers and they don't get percentages. And it's amazing how many times as an accountant when you'd sit down with a small business owner and they'd nod at you when you were going through their accounts. And if you asked anything that required a little level of understanding, it was amazing how exposed that business owner was. And they're pretty much afraid, I suppose, to tell us and admit that they don't understand their numbers. And so it's really important as an accountant that we sit down and help our clients understand their key numbers and what that means about their business. It's also about getting access to, 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 to the numbers too. So getting your numbers from a regular perspective. And from all the work that Kelly and I have been doing over the past uh, six or eight months on various events, it's pretty much obvious, or sorry, that the, the general stat is that you know, 20% of your clients will get regular management accounts. That's up to 20%. There are obviously, of course, those niche accounting firms that specialize in management reporting and business advisory where they might be up to 50%. But generally, in most general accounting firms, up to 20% of clients get management information. And often that might be just a push of a button from Zero or QuickBooks or Sage. So this is not about uh, proper management accounts with revenue recognition adjustments with accruals, prepayments, you name it. This is just basic management accounting. And when you get into that, who gets proper management accounts, that number can sometimes be uh, a lot lower than, than that 20% figure. And finally, the last one is planning. Um, I, I don't know, my clients spent more time planning their holiday than they did in their business. I, I don't know why. I think maybe they left corporate and they decided I wanted to do this differently. We want to be flexible. We don't want to be held to targets. We don't want to be on a on a uh, treadmill. We want to wing it and we want to be flexible and nimble. Or perhaps they just think, I don't know how to plan, or maybe I don't know what's going to happen in 12 months, let alone six. So I think planning is a waste of time. Well, we know that no successful in the business, business in the world operates without a plan. Nothing, in fact, in the world really generally gets created without a plan. 
And if you think about it, any piece of art, music, or anything structural like a building, an engine, a car, need a plan. Now, that's not to say that the plan's not going to change, that we're not going to add, for example, if we're going to build a house, we're not going to start with blocks on the ground. We're going to have a, a, an idea of what that house is going to look like. It doesn't mean that we're not going to change the layout, change corridors, put windows in a different place, paint it a different color, add a conservatory to it. So absolutely, the plans can change, but we do need to know where we're going. We need to have an idea of whether we're on track or off track. And if we're on track, how do we double down on that? And if we're off track, how do we get back on track? We need our clients to understand the various scenarios in their business. So planning is really, really critical. And again, when we talk to accountants about planning, up to 5% of clients have a plan. Now, given how critical planning is, we believe every single one of your clients should have a plan. And nowadays with technology, it's really possible for all your clients to have a plan. So let's look at how we can get that number up from five, certainly to 20 and even beyond would be a, a good start. So when we look at as well, so those are the challenges facing small business owners. When we look at what, account, what small business owners are looking for from their accountants, this is a survey. It goes back to 2018, unfortunately, but it was done last year by 2020 in the UK. And the only difference was number three and number four switched around. But that survey effectively showed that 70% of your clients, so almost 80%, if you go up to that 78%, so when we're looking at 70 to 80% of your clients are looking for more from you than just a compliance accounts and tax return service. They're looking for you to be a trusted advisor, that horrible nebulous term. It means a trusted friend, somebody, an intelligent friend, somebody that they can share their pains, their issues, their challenges with. Most small business owners, it's a, it's a lonely place. They don't have somebody to talk to. Their friends are mostly employed. And if they're not and they're self-employed, then they don't want to admit weakness or failure. So it's very tricky for them to talk to their family, to talk to their friends. And so by being there as an accountant, just listening to, to their issues and challenges in a safe haven, a safe environment, it's an amazing service that we've got to offer. But add to that, responding quickly to their queries, being, uh, being affordable, understanding them and their industry and communicating that to them uh, as non-accountants are what most of your clients are looking for. Now to deliver this for all of your clients is going to need a Herculean effort to do this. If you think about it, to be cost-effective, to do it quickly, to communicate with your clients in uh, plain English, to understand all of them and to be their trusted advisor all at the same time is going to need you to combine people, power, uh, sorry, people, process, and technology. You've got to leverage those three in the right order to be able to drive this forward. So accountants do have all the superpowers necessary. They certainly can change the world. And as Prince Charles said at an ICAW dinner that they were going to save the world and everybody laughed at him. They couldn't understand how would accountants save the world. Well, we know that the abilities of accountants to be able to do everything that a small business owner needs to be able to help them grow scalably and sustainably to be able to find a more profitable solution, to be able to grow in a way that doesn't mean they're going to grow broke is an amazing asset to have. And it's about time as a, as a profession, we were, I suppose, proud of our, our capes and we wore them with pride. So hopefully uh, today you can get your cape out. Right, business advisory. So I, I'm Irish, by the way, I talk a lot. So please do interrupt me. Please do ask questions. It'll probably be good. Um, and if you've got anything that you want to say or anything you disagree with or agree with, then please do drop it in the chat too. So business advisory, why is it like baking a cake? Well, I've got a picture of a chocolate cake up here. I actually, I'm a cheesecake kind of guy. I don't know what you all are. Do you prefer chocolate cake or cheesecake or uh, pudding? Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, I've got chocolate here because it's kind of gooey. The reason I picked this one is because it's the nemesis of contestants on uh, uh, MasterChef. So you've seen many contestants on MasterChef and they lose their place generally because once they cut into that chocolate fondant, it doesn't melt. Now, if we go back to just baking on itself, think about baking. When you're baking, it's not like a science. You can't, sorry, it is a science. You can't just wing it. If you wing it in baking, you're going to fail. You need to have the right ingredients. You need to have all the right ingredients. You need to follow a recipe and you need to follow that recipe religiously. You need to, when you're baking that cake, how many times have you seen contestants on the Great British Bake Off on the floor staring into their ovens, watching the cake baking? You've got to be measuring and monitoring as you're going along. So you've got to be adjusting those timings 
and that temperature to be able to bake the perfect cake. And that's much the same in business and it's much the same in advisory. Kelly's smiling at me, so she was going to jump in. Were you going to offer your favorite cake? <laughs> yeah, it, was, it wasn't probably, um, and it was just literally talking about cake. That was as much input. I was saying that um, whenever I do a presentation with this image and talk about it, it makes me very hungry for cake. Mm. But we know we love an analogy when it comes to food and um, food and drinks. <laughs> Thank you. So putting that into a little bit more scientific perspective from an accounting uh, frame of mind or mindset, I'm going to give you a framework for business advisory here. This is the same framework that's used by the big four, by all the consulting firms in the world. This is the framework that's used, whether it's business advisory, wealth management advisory, tax advisory, marketing advisory. Every single advisory engagement follows this process. And it's quite simply this. We need to help our clients understand where they are now. We need to help them understand where they could or should get to, what that gap is, and help them calculate that gap from a critical thinking perspective. We need them to help them understand how do we create a plan to close the gap, and then how are we going to measure or monitor the results versus the plan. It's that simple. Every single advisory engagement worldwide follows this process, and it's the same whether it's from Bain all the way down to an accountancy firm in Cheltenham. Now, obviously, depending on the size of the client and the size of the engagement, you can go deeper or lighter in each of these areas, but you're still going to follow the same process from a business advisory perspective. And even probably from a capital advisory perspective, we might want to change some of the language slightly, but it's still going to be a very similar process as well. So let me take you through that process now from a practical perspective. That's great, Ainsley. So that's fine. How do we do it? This is about how do we deliver business advisory to our 80% of clients that want that help. We know that accountants do very well by their top 10, 20% of clients. Inherently, you love and care for them. They're well looked after, they pay good fees, you have good communications with them at a high level within the accounting firm. And when they ask for help or when they need help, whether it's structured or unstructured, they generally get a business advisory support service from you. This is about the 80% of clients out there that are just getting an accounts and tax return service. So this is how do we deliver a business advisory solution to more of our clients? And we do it in a way that's profitable for the firm. It can be done in a time efficient way that's valuable for the small business owner and at a price that they'd love to pay for. So if you're good for that, this is what we're going to cover in this session. So a profitable, scalable, time effective, valuable, service line that small business owners are going to be willing to pay your fee for. It's good. Sounds good. Okay, let's get cracking. Where are your clients now? Okay, in Clarity, we use the seven key numbers. This is about how do we make sure more of our clients get a business advisory service. This isn't saying that these are the only seven key numbers that every small business owner should know. They should know these seven numbers. There will be other key performance indicators that are important. But if we've got to get started and we need to get started in a place that is enabling us to do this for all of our clients, these are the seven key numbers. If I knew these seven numbers for your accounting firm, I would have an amazing picture of your business all in one screen. In fact, for an accounting firm, I really only need to know your revenue per employee for me to have a good understanding of how effective, efficient, and how profitable you are. So I'm going to be looking at that number is going to give me a massive insight into how systemed and processed you are, how much you leverage technology, how effective and efficiently you're, you're, you're resourced internally, and how you're delivering and what added value services you're delivering to your clients. And that number from a UK perspective needs to be about the 125K to 150K mark. That's where a firm's doing superior uh, value and delivering uh, a high level to its clients and good profitability. Now, obviously, if I knew all seven of these key numbers for your accounting firm, I'd have an even bigger picture of your business. Can you imagine if you knew these seven key numbers for every single one of your clients, how much of a better view and handle on your business, on their businesses you'd have? And can you imagine if your clients understood these seven key numbers for their own business as well? how much better they would have a view and an understanding of where they are now and where they could get to. So this is going to give them a huge understanding of where they are now. Obviously, revenue, for, you know, we're looking at revenue and revenue growth is a critical number. Most coaches and marketing consultants are pushing revenue growth for, at the cost of all else. 
We as accountants know that revenue comes with costs and to grow scalably and not grow broke, we need to be careful of the associated costs with that revenue growth. Gross profit, how about understanding the contribution that every activity that the top line generates to their overheads? Where are they focusing their efforts as a business owner? As an accountant, by breaking down their GP by product or service line, you're giving them an amazing insight into the activities that are contributing to overheads and a great way to understand whether the business is focusing in the right areas. Operating profit is a key number. Profit first has been a, 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 you know, a huge success pretty much around the world. It's the focus for entrepreneurs on their profit, a number that they sometimes forget about. It's putting profit at the center of everything that they do. And from a, a, a valuation perspective, from an affordability, from a lending perspective, operating profit and EBITDA are numbers that, that the finance world is looking really heavily into. And it's important that your business owners understand the relationship and how they need to get their EBIT or EBITDA number up. Revenue per employee, we've said it's a good holistic number. It's looking at the efficiency of the systems and processes, the resources, the staffing levels, but also the effectiveness of the team as well. Cash conversion cycle, you know that one is cash days, how much every, every pound you spend, how long it takes to come back into your bank account. And core cash target, Ollie mentioned this. This is about how to build a resilient balance sheet. And we're using core cash target from uh, scaling up, which is two months overheads plus taxes set aside. So a really great target to hit for. Now, can you imagine pre-pandemic, if your clients have had two months overheads plus their taxes set aside on their balance sheet, how much stronger position they would have been? Now, we know small business owners strip their balance sheet, but now is a great time to get them thinking about better business behaviors and habits and core cash target is a critical one to get them thinking about. And business return again is our adaptation on return on capital employed. That's because most, as we said, small business owners strip their balance sheet. So traditional measures of ROI or return on capital employed don't really work for small businesses. So we've just adapted that number slightly. It's a tricky one to have a discussion with your clients on. Should they be uh, getting a job or would they be better putting their money in a bank account? But uh, be careful when you start discussing a business return. It's like insulting somebody's baby. So do take that one with caution. So that's a really good way and a great way for you to quickly get a good understanding of all your clients, where they are now, and helping them understand where they are now. If you think about it, seven numbers that your team have to learn and seven numbers that your clients have to learn, it's a great way stripping back the complexity and focusing in and zooming in on the really important things that matter. Now, I'm not saying that the business owners won't have other KPIs, and as they grow or as the assignment grows, you won't want to focus on working on other KPIs with them, but it's a great place to start. It's those seven key numbers. So where could or should that business owner get to? Well, again, let's go back to those seven key numbers. Magically, they turn into five levers of success. So again, can you imagine it, your team, seven numbers and five levers to learn. It's the same for your clients. And each of these levers has an impact on profit and the cash position of the business. Can you imagine if you could get your clients to understand what activities drove what levers and what levers did what to their profit and cash position? How a better uh, um, management of their business they would have, a better understanding of their business and a better understanding of the activities that they're doing how it's impacting on their bottom line or what numbers need to change to improve their bottom line and therefore drive what activities need to happen. That's the conversations that you could start having with your clients to get them into their numbers and to get them understanding what they need to be doing in their business. Now, taking a step back, you said, well, where could we, should we get to? Well, most business owners, when you ask them, they haven't taken time out of their business and they don't have that vision. They don't look forward or it's very difficult for them to project forward. So if we help them and we work with them on doing sensitivity analysis on each of these levers, we can do very quick calculations to show them what's possible in their business. This is very visual for the small business owner and it's done in a way where they can understand what you're doing and can understand what impact it's having on their bottom line and whether they want a piece of the action or not. So a very quick and simple way for you to help your clients understand where they are now and understand potentially where they could get to. So the next part of that puzzle is understanding the gap. So what's the gap? Very simple, easy to do here. This is an accountant's dream. So where am I now? Where could I get to? What's that gap? Simple. 
But the beauty about an accountant getting involved in gap analysis is that you bring critical thinking to play here. So if a business owner has been growing at a rate of 5% per annum and suddenly they want to double that or quadruple it or they want to double their revenue, you've got the ability to say, okay, how are you going to do that? Does that make sense? You haven't done it before. Why are you going to do it this time? What's different? What's happening in the business? So by you bringing your critical thinking skills to this gap analysis, you're again doing an amazing service for that small business owner. But in addition to that, you're also able to analyze the effects of each of these areas on profit and cash to understand which is going to have the biggest improvement to profit and cash and therefore which areas you need to be focusing on or the clients need to be focusing on to drive their business forward. So this is going to give you an easy understanding of the areas to focus on and which ones that your clients should be focusing on first so that you can work with them to create those plans to be able to close that gap. So where are you now? Where could you get to? What's that gap? And I'm going backwards in my uh, slide deck. So I'm getting excited pushing buttons here. This is the problem when you only have one screen, Ollie. Fantastic. So we've understood that gap. We now need to close that gap and we need to start creating plans to close that gap. The first plan is a simple one that every single accountant here knows. It's the financial plan. You've got a raft of technology to help you with this. You've got Excel for those really ex ex you know, complex bespoke models. You've got uh, any number of uh, futurely, fluidly, fathom, uh, castaway to do anyway from three to four way projections or onwards. So this is your bread and butter. It's so simple for you to create that financial plan. But we know that only 5% of our clients or less are getting financial plans. So how do we make sure that all of our clients get a financial plan? Sometimes as accountants, we're always aiming for perfect. We're always aiming for, we know, need to know the accounting treatment, the double entry, we need to know the tax treatment of everything. And when we're thinking about that, that then comes into other areas of business. And so sometimes perfect is costly, too difficult to achieve and takes too much time. Sometimes good enough is good enough. Now as an accountant, I used to always hate the last year plus 5% way of uh, creating a financial plan or a budget. But in the absence of anything, it's better to start with the last year plus 5% get the client on the, the journey, that horrible term, get them used to doing this, get them thinking about their business and get them uh, understanding the importance of planning. So let's maybe not aim for high perfection every time. Let's take it down a notch so that we can make sure all of our clients get involved in financial planning. So let's create a financial plan for every single one of our clients. More importantly- Are, are we allowed to invest in that business? Was that? <laughs> well, Absolutely. Right, Let's plan. look at those numbers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> EIS, obviously. Let's get that sorted. Um, in addition to the financial plan that you as accountants are eminently capable of dealing with, and I'm not going to waste any more time on that, other than, again, hammering home the point, can you at least make sure that more than 5% of your clients get one? The next stage is an action plan. So it's not good enough just doing a financial plan for your clients. Your clients need to understand the actions they need to take to make that plan a reality. And this is where you can work with them to create a very simple who, what, when action plan. We like these at Clarity. We like simplicity. This who, what, when creates focus. It creates responsibility and ownership. And it creates accountability. So focus, responsibility, accountability. Who is going to do what by when? Simple. And if we can do that for each of those levers, each of the levers that are going to have a big impact on our bottom line, we're going to be helping our clients understand the actions they need to take to drive their profit and cash position. And we're going to be able to hold them accountable going forward to see whether they're undertaking those activities or what activities aren't working in the way we had planned. So let's get those action plans in place. And the, the last plan that we really need to focus on is a funding plan. Because as Oli said at the top of this, it's, not, it's all very well talking to a client about growing their business or changing their business or making it more efficient or more effective. Generally, that's going to need to be funded. Somewhere that's going to have to be funded, either from reserves, and very few businesses can fund from reserves. Most are going to have to look to outside to fund that growth or to fund those changes in the business. And this is where your funding plan is critical. Now, Clarity, we like, three, we like simplicity again. So this is our three-step process for a funding plan. So understanding if it's the right, so qualifying that, that client, are they right for a loan? Have we looked at three sources of finance? Is 
funding is capital, what's the right solution for them to be able to fund that growth? The next one is quantification. So how much are they going to need over what period? And is it affordable? And the last one is getting together the information in the right way so that you can present it in the best light to get best chance of success. That's where you're doing your job and making sure four times more likely that client is to get a loan with your help. And this is why effectively you're in the process and what you can add to the process to be able to help from that perspective. Ollie's going to go way more into funding in the next session. Just wanted to touch on it here to show you with those plans how important those three are together. And the last thing is about measuring and monitoring the results versus the plan. So it's all very well creating that plan. We need to understand how that plan is working in reality and is it, is it delivering what it's supposed to do. And again, this is an amazing ability for you to offer this great service here. This is about budget versus actual. What did we say we were going to do? And there's a variance. Why is there a variance? And the variance is probably one of four reasons. Firstly, the client hasn't done what they're supposed to do, quite simply. And how can we help them do it? And how can we help them get that focus? And how can we keep them and bring them back on track? The second reason there's a variance, potentially, is the plan is cookie and the plan needs changing. So what we thought was a good plan was a rubbish plan or it's not practical and we need to change that plan. Now, I wouldn't advocate changing the plan every month, certainly not. But during the year, if we're going to see the same variances rocking up month on month on month, then we do need to make a change to that plan because we can't keep discounting the same variances. It becomes clunky and it distracts the client from, from taking the actions that they need to do. So they didn't do something, the plan was wrong, or they did something that they shouldn't have done. It wasn't in the plan. We hadn't, it wasn't on the action list. And it had an impact on their bottom line and not in the way that they were anticipating. Or lastly, what we thought was the right action was wrong. Now, if we're measuring and monitoring this on a monthly basis for, with our clients, we're not getting them too far down the road before we uncover a problem. This is great risk management here. Most entrepreneurs or small business owners don't take action because they fear failure. This is stopping that fear. It's showing them. It's being on top of it. It's being there and understanding if actions are working or they need to be changed or if something's not working, what needs to change? What's happening to the bottom line? And this is a great service and a very simple way for you to be able to help with that feedback loop and create that continuous improvement. And again, keeping them accountable. So what do they say they were going to do and did they do it? And if not, what can we do to bring back that focus or how can we help them take those actions? So that's a very whistle-stop tour of business advisory, um, conscious of time and that we need to uh, make sure I'm not uh, overrunning here. But I wanted to give you a quick summary and put it into perspective for you. So this is the framework. Where are your clients now? Where could, should they get to? What's the gap? Let's create a plan to close that gap and let's help them measure and monitor results versus the plan. And with inside clarity, you can do each of these five steps. So the seven key numbers every business owner knows, should know, can help you help your clients understand where they are now. The five levers and the sensitivity analysis on those five levers helps your clients understand what activities drive what levers drive what results. Let's give them that critical thinking on that gap analysis and let's help them create an action plan, a financial plan and a funding plan to help them create a better business. And then let's, like the analogy of baking, let's stare into that oven, let's measure and monitor, let's adjust temperatures and timings, let's help them create that continuous improvement through regular meetings going forward, measuring that budget versus actual. So I hope that's put it into perspective for you. I hope that's given you a very simple framework that you can see how the team can get involved. This doesn't always rely on the managers and partners in the accounting firm to deliver business advisory. This is an area that more of your team can get involved in and can start helping business owners to actually achieve some success. And when I talked about going a little deeper, well, here are some examples of how each of these levels, you can go that little bit deeper. So you can get involved in strategic SWAS analysis, in looking at their tax effectiveness and their tax position, looking at the bookkeeping functions and how they're recording transactions and how you can make that better. Looking at the team processes and the systems, we can start getting into more complex routes, financial models, CFO support services, board meetings, you know, use of pro forma agendas. And this gives you an ability to go deeper and for those clients that want to take it to the next level. So hopefully I've given you a good overview of that business advisory framework.
And uh, Kelly's going to hop in and give me a break and give you a break for me too. <laughs> Thanks, Ainsley. Um, yeah, I mean, this, what this is, is just we have a calculator that's on our website that um, if you are new uh, to advisory and new to understanding how you can scale it, uh, then we have this calculator where you can create your own plan. So you can look uh, into what you currently spend um, and what your um, current outgoings are. Uh, and then you can look at your client base and how, how many of your client base would be looking at advisory. And then you can make those calculations to be able to see the, the, the true potential that you've got within, within your firm uh, to be able to offer this out to, to your clients. Uh, so I would definitely recommend having a look at that calculator. Um, I'll catch up with everyone uh, after this um, uh, call over the next few days um, anyway, and we can go through together and the calculator, uh, but it's it's a it's an amazing tool to to see uh, what where your firm is and and what uh, what you can achieve um, through all of this. Effectively doing your own gap analysis for yeah. your firm too. Now this works, uh, Kelly, for departments. It works for the entire firm. It works for your own client portfolio. So depending where you are situated in the firm, you're going to be able to do that for your own department, your own client base are for the firm as a whole and we're not taking any details so this is completely confidential you can yeah. play with those numbers charts content yeah that's right you don't have to put in um any of your firm names or anything like that it's purely just numbers um to be able to to see um the gap and what the true potential is um within the business and also what i love about it is it, it'll show you um, any extra staffing that you might be able to, to have within there. So if there is any uh, members of staff you want to bring in to, to help with this further or take um, anyone from, from other areas of the business, um, it gives you a, a real full plan of, of, of action. And then what I wanted to um, let you all know about is our, is our workshops. So we run um, a workshop uh, we run about two a, two a month. Um, and what these workshops are is they're, they're practical events. So they're not a webinar. Um, they're not uh, something that you just sit on and, and watch. They're a practical workshop that would have ideally been a one day session. Um, but now we've split that in for the virtual world um, to split that into uh, four sessions over four weeks where you get homework and um, things to, to do um, between the events. And what you do uh, on these workshops is really understanding even further the fundamentals of business advisory and how you can use clarity um, within that full process. And there is accountability. You work with your peers uh, within there along with um, St uh, either Stephen or Ainsley, uh, the founders of Clarity, um, and they can impart all of their knowledge and wisdom uh, on you with, with throughout the workshop. Um, so it is a, is a perfect uh, starting point um, to, to learn, to gain knowledge, um, but also get a, um, a hit the ground running uh, for, for using Clarity as well. Absolutely, Kelly. And we found by doing this online, actually, it's created a massive benefit for us because yeah. by breaking it into four, we had that really tight uh, loop of learning, implementation, accountability, learning, implementation, accountability. Yeah. And this, this workshop is achieving massive results. I mean, people are, are you know, earning um, GRF of of up to 40K additionally from one month of actually getting stuff done and being held accountable. So it does work. It uh, is heavily focused on outcomes. So as accountants, often we focus on input. Mm -hmm. This course is, and workshop is all focused on outcomes and making the right outcomes for your firm. So great. How do they get more details? Or get so in touch you can um go to the link um in the chat um we have just posted a, a amy's posted a link that you can go directly to the page um you will get a um discount on the workshop uh, by because you've attended this uh webinar um so i would definitely jump on um on that as soon as you can and look at our next dates for uh for the workshop the next one is starting on the 6th of april um and then if you are an an early bird we have one on the uh on the 20th of april that is uh early morning um and then we'll have more in may because they've been so popular um we are carrying this on and um and building out even more 
even more workshops. So um, I, again, like I say, I'll be in touch with everyone after this, just to um, just to catch up, see your thoughts on 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 this webinar, and then we'll we can discuss the workshop. Um, but if everything that we've said today is really sort of lit a fire under you, and, and you're excited to to be on that, uh, then click on that link in the chat, um, and it'll take you straight to to the page to give you more information. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, Ollie, over to you. I mute, so I don't. Oh, I just talked about the mute button. That's terrible. Um, so. Cool. Should, I, should we flip on? I, I can just do. If we flip on to the next slide, I can. I can think. I can start from start from there. Um, cool. So, um, given the timing of this um, webinar, I thought it'd be quite important to talk about um, kind of where we are in the funding market right now. Um, we have a web webinar for our um, for our accountants, which is on a fairly regular basis, which is basically keeping them updated as we have done over the last year on the fairly outrageous flux in the lending world that has happened uh, through the COVID um, um, situation. So I actually had a baby on the 4th of March, or I had a baby, it's an outrageous phrase. My wife had a baby, um, uh, my second, our second, and I wanted to turn to leave right at the start of March, came back just into March and the whole world had changed. Suddenly, if it's secured lending, there were no lawyers available or valuations available to go and to on site, so you couldn't get any lending. The entire unsecured world didn't trust the forecasts of any customers of any clients, and so you suddenly had a period where, well, if you didn't have your core cash target uh, or you hadn't hit your core cash target and your core cash situation wasn't very good, you actually didn't have any sources of capital. So during March, there was basically no money available for SMEs that, that needed it. And considering we have a platform with 130 plus lenders, it was, it was a really interesting um, and alarming situation to suddenly find ourselves in. Um, and so what happened as a, a bit of a history is as soon as pretty quickly created the bounce back. Obviously, he put, did the furlough scheme, income support, had some grants to eat out and froze a load of HMRC based um, pieces. But, you know, as in, obviously that's the world that you guys live in on day to day. I'll, I'll talk to you a bit more about the, um, the kind of purple lines is he introduced bounce back loan, which was basically a grant, um, you know, a 2.5% fixed interest up to five years, up to 10 years, sorry, um, based on for 50, up to 50K based on self declarations and no bank underwriting. So it really is a interesting form of lending. There is not a single bank that's in any way um, has underwritten any of these and a huge amount of lending has gone into this. Um, these are ending um, in two weeks time. But more importantly for your more sophisticated uh, companies was the, the C-bills, uh, the kind of interruption loan, which was anywhere from 50K up to 5 million. And so as throughout last year, we were getting to the point where we had one lender doing it, two lenders doing it. And eventually we got to the point where 100 plus lenders were on, you know, on, on the panel and, and doing this. And there was really interesting phone calls that we were constantly having with lenders like, we're not sure yet. We don't know. We haven't, we haven't got through to the BBB. We, we can't tell you whether it's, it's there or, or what's happening. But what happened in the end is it created a once in a lifetime loan. I mean you had no PG up to 250K. Um, before the coronavirus, almost every piece of lending in the UK had some form of PG attached to it. It did have a full underwriting service, but the rates were going from two to 11%. And that was realistically any business that could prove that it was not in difficulty before um, the coronavirus hit, because obviously many businesses were in difficulties once it happened. And it was a very interesting time and that lending there was no interest or um, fees for the first uh, year so realistically it's it was a way of getting your core cash target immediately up without any uh, repercussions of any kind for a whole year because you could pay it back within a year so what's really important is that opportunity is going in two weeks time recovery loans is not a c-bill in any uh, or a corona interruption lending, so I haven't said the full name for such a long time, um, is, is, is leaving the market. If you are going to help your clients with, um, with those, you've really got two, two weeks to go. 
because we've got such close relationships with all our lenders, they have promised us that any application up to the 31st of March deadline, even though it's processed in April, will be eligible for it. Um, so really do check your all your clients' um, cash targets right now and what where they are, um, because we, we're in uncertain times and it really is a benefic- beneficial lending environment. And, you know, having I haven't worked in lending forever, but I've, it's been a good 12, 15 years now. And this is unheard of. It's a very unusually generous scheme. So that's happening. But the, the big question for us, if you could flick on to the next slide, uh, is, is basically what is the loan? Uh, what is the recovery loan scheme? So commercial lending has kind of been on pause, except for secured lending. And, and we've seen a huge um, rise in secured lending. During the popularity pre-COVID, lots of people were just going for unsecured because they thought it was easier. Now, with the lending environment, we've actually found that we're doing a, a much larger amount of secured lending than we've ever done. But the, the interesting piece for us is what is the difference from the knowledge we've got so far from speaking to the lenders. And very interestingly for you, a lot of lenders will say they don't actually know to certain of our questions. So I'll tell you the kind of bits where um, we don't actually know the answer because the lenders don't know the answer but there will be um no pgs so the um recovery loan scheme starts on the 6th of april so we're actually gonna have a, just under a week of, of of no schemes available um so you will have a bit of time where you, there can't actually be anything done um and there is going to be a full underwriting process um there'll be no pgs under 250k which is um which is quite positive. The same criteria of business must have been in difficulties, not been difficult before. Um, and the government will still be backing 80% of that loan by guarantee. That's a huge, um, a huge piece. But, and this is a, a big but, there were pretty generous interest rate caps in bounce backs. Well, bounce back was a fixed one at 2.5 and the C bills was capped very generously up to 11%. And, you know, we've got pretty good um, data and um, kind of pricing algorithms where we would compare what they would get in the normal market versus what they could get on C bills. And you're talking anywhere up to one and a half and two times cheaper um, because of those caps. Those caps are not going to happen. Um, they're, they're not going to be there anymore. The lender will have more. Uh, ability to choose based on they believe the risk of the situation so that could mean lending will suddenly become um, more expensive interest and fees will be paid from the outset so rather so with it you've only got two weeks time for a loan where you can actually not pay anything for a year that's capital and interest from the 6th of april you'll have to pay as well the loan lenders are being encouraged to put their normal products alongside so that will be the return of things like arrangement fees um, and other things like that, because obviously the lenders have been on very interesting uh, P&Ls for a while, where they've just been completely outside their normal business. Obviously, you know, you, you, um, they, even though they planned, that would have, you know, they've never predicted what the government basically changed their business model into, because they've all been basically giving government money out on a fixed scheme. And that's been quite a big change. So the 25 uh, percent turnover limits go is not going to happen anymore so uh, theoretically if you're a very successful growing company you could get higher um, than that um, and that's they're all the kind of key changes so to highlight that that's the fixed the in the, the, the kind of cap on size um, the cap on fees are, will both be going um, and you'll have to start paying interest rate from the offset so it's un unknown right now is it going to be the same 100 plus lenders um will you know will there be the same demand um the uk has never seen this type of lending uh, in a year it's you know you've gone from half the uk being permanent non-borrowers to over half the uk looking for loans so it's been a very big change in the market um and will the lenders be able to change their processes in time particularly the banks these are very large institutions once they took um, March, April, some of them into May to actually release their C bills um, 
loans. And that was even once they're accredited. The staff at the British Business Bank are only a certain size and banks were very uh, unused to um, all being remote. So actually there could be a period of time when it takes the banks a while to be able to work out how they can do the recovery loan scheme. Um, so there are a few uncertainties, but the key benefits is it will still be backed by um, uh, the UK government and, and it will be a very positive uh, scheme but nothing on what the current loan scheme is and what is available for the next um, two weeks. So at Capitalize, we have never seen volume of um, accountants coming in um, with clients looking for C bills for the end as we have now. Um, and you know, it is, is really a benefit to a, a customer looking for loan. If you are looking for more capital for any which way that you need it, um, it's a very positive time right now for the next two weeks. How would you suggest people go about this, Ollie? I mean, is this, is this like, I mean, reading between the lines, we're saying if a client has got a potential funding requirement in the next 12 months, we should be looking at it in the next two weeks. Is that? I, I would say that's a pretty good assessment it, for really helping your business. We, we have a tried and tested way of, um, getting C-bills, we've got 100 plus lenders, we know exactly how that will happen. We have complete un uncertainty around how long it will take for the recovery loans to kick in. We know that you'll have to pay um, interest and capital straight from the offset um, and that you, know, you, you will be losing out on probably one of the big, biggest benefits. And I'm a massive optimist in life and I very much believe this is the end of the uh, lockdown environment and the Brazil variants no gonna come nowhere near us. Um, and we're all gonna be absolutely fine and trade out like the bank filling says that we might actually uh, return to pre COVID levels before the end of this. But if there's any form of uncertainty in your business model um, of any of your clients, it, it is very important in the next two weeks to get that. Sure. And as, as we come out of recessions in the past, if anything's, if, if the past is anything to, to show us for, for now, more businesses fail coming out of a recession than they do inside a recession. So this is about helping and protecting your clients and giving them that insulation for the next couple of months. Yes. So we monitor things like um, through, through our crowd connections with our clients, things like their, the age of their debtors um, and other, other things within their um, systems because of the fact that that's another way you can get capital into the business. And everything like that has been on very unusual levels for a very long time. Lots of people haven't asked for uh, money back from their clients. Uh, lots of people have situations where they're probably trading at what is termed as a zombie place, um, which means that they, aren't, they don't actually have a viable business model anymore. Um, so it, there, there could be all types of flux um, in the market as you basically unwind out of all this um, kind of rescue, all these rescue packages from the government. Um, that is a tricky time for a business. Great, Ali, and turnaround time. So how, how, how long, so if, if you wanna to say to a client, okay, we've got a funding requirement in the next six months, let's get it under C-bills. How long is it gonna take them to get that money? So how long is the process gonna take? It's to get it in and get the, Get, yeah, so it's quite an interesting piece. It could be 48 hours from some of the um, some of our providers. Um, some of our providers actually had cash uh, shortfalls because British Business Bank hadn't released the cash to them yet. Um, most of them have promised we win, and we constantly are not showing uh, funding lines to any of those lenders at any one time. It's been really interesting. The, uh, the allotment of cash has been moving between if each of the different lenders because basically the British Business Bank hadn't got enough staff to allocate enough to allocate cash to each one of the hundred lenders. Um, so it's been a, it's been a, a fascinating um, time, but you will get it within uh, one or two weeks. Okay. That's, that's fast. Well, yes, not as fast as the, the lender. We, we would have promised within 48 hours uh, pre COVID for anything up to somewhere where the lawyers would need to become involved in the fully secured market, um, which is, you know, could still be anywhere up to, well, it's kind of two to four weeks is, is kind of how much I'd um, signal you if you're actually looking for something, um, you know, with, with full security in it. And um, what level of information needs to 
a company that that's application? What's typical? Uh, I know again, it's how long is a piece of string? I'm asking you kind of generic no, 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 questions. It's, I appreciate it's, it. It's, um, your bank statements, last set of filed, uh, last uh, set of filed accounts, and some management information. Okay. Much management information. It would vary depending on what's okay. in the management information, but um, okay. And that's that's something that we um, our funding specialists have now got. Uh, extreme experience with what each level of uh, management information needed from each of the different firms, each of the different lenders. Um, so, you know, that's all the kind of part that we're managing day in, day out um, and making sure, um, you know, every, every application is successful. Fantastic. Thanks, Holly. Have we got any questions from anybody? Has anybody got any burning questions or uh, things they want to ask Holly or even me from what, what's happened before? If you just want to drop those into the Q&A or into the chat, that would be great. Otherwise, it's going to be a quiet little period here. I think, obviously, it's been very clear, Ollie. so there's not much coming through. Um, what would you say to people? So how, how, what process do they need to go through to make this happen for their clients? Uh, well, jump on your platform and press Get Funding. And, and we've linked up together um, and you will go through both our platforms and in the end, you will get the money very quickly and easily for your clients. Okay, so if Ollie's saying, for example, if you're on Clarity and you're a Clarity negative core cash target, you can go straight through um, and fund that application right through into Capitalize, into their API and then into their top four lenders and then have a, a, a regulated person who's going to be checking that and going to be helping you with that whole process. So you're not left on your own at all Capitalize supports you throughout the whole process. Okay, Carol has a question. I need to sign up to Capitalize. How do I do that? I have a loan request to submit. Um, you can do that yeah. through Clarity, I believe. You can, yeah. yep. I'll let you, let you say that. <laughs> yeah, just jump on and with your client connect through Clarity and, um, and jump on and you'll be able to go through the system and you'll have one of our uh, um, funding specialists call you up um, immediately to help you through the process. Yep. So we've changed our, our API um, recently so that you can sign up for a capitalized account through the API, Carol. So you don't have to create a, a free account. You can actually sign up for a paid account through that whole process, I believe. Yes. Yes, that's done, done that. It's the commissions I'm asking about. Um, if there's a if there, if you signed up for a free account beforehand and you want to transfer that to a paying account to capitalize for commissions, then I'm sure uh, Ollie can put you in touch with one of the team who will make that who will do whatever they need to do to make that happen. Yes, and that's something you know. One one of the things we pride ourselves in is you know we are creating revenue lines within businesses uh, within your accountancy firm, um, and you know we've got. Uh, hundreds of accountants using the platform and thousands, hundreds of firms and thousands of actual accountants on the platform. Um, and, you know, as in the same way with Clarity, we really can help you create a new revenue stream within your business. And we do still believe that you are the right person to um, be doing this as well. Great. Um, Carol, she said she's talking to Nick about the loan, so I presume Nick will sort her in the right direction and make sure whatever needs to happen happens. You are in very safe hands. Um, you've been with us since nearly the start fantastic okay carol you, you've heard that <laughs> thanks okay pleasure um i was going to ask you one question i got distracted um with with clicking and and going through buttons it was quite a good question too so um, <laughs> i will come back to that I, I will i will i'm thinking from my accounting perspective so i wanted to put that hat on so um if you've got any more questions anybody then please um jump in otherwise uh ollie what's going to happen next week or two weeks time on the 30th of March. Um, sure. So, so what what we do when you um, sign to capitalize is uh, we take you through um, a kind of education series on how to build a capital advisory um, service within your firm, um, how to actually find all that cash once you've highlighted the need, um, and what I will do is take you on um, the journey through that process and basically give give you some of that education up front, so you can really understand um, what the lending market looks like, what all the different forms of capital are into a business and how you can help your clients with each one of those sources of capital. Fantastic. Uh, what I was gonna ask you was about charging. So how do, your, how do you 
uh, find a lot of your accountants are charging for that funding support or that capital advisory support? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, it, we've got a lot of different firms, all the way from uh, large kind of hourly charging firms to young kind of fixed price, fully cloud um, firms. And so it does vary wildly. Um, we do always recommend that you charge for the service. It, it's, it's getting into helping with things like lending is you can benefit so much. You can benefit your clients so much in the process that you really are giving a great value into that. So some people charge on their hourly basis, um, and but more people charge on a kind of fixed fee, 250, even up to 2,000 pounds for the kind of hours needed to help with funding. Um, and the great things like that is using our platform, we enhance your efficiencies um, of finding that lending. So all you are needing to do is find the, the reason, the amount, the need, um, and get some of the documents for us, and our platform does everything else for you. Fantastic. Sorry. Some people are sending in uh, to privately to me. That's fine if you want to put a question in privately to me. But if you do want to just click that down arrow and send it to all, then that's good as well if you want to, 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 to chat to, to other people. The question that came in is about, is, is funding covered under the standard? This is a typical accountant's question. Is the funding covered under the standard terms of engagement with the clients? Um, so we do have... Um, example engagement letters as part of our playbook to help you build a capital advisory service. So it all depends on what your, um, what your engagement letter says. Um, we can send you the exact wording you need to be fully compliant, um, but sometimes we found firms have already got that in um, and some haven't. So just as all we know, we've onboarded and, and made um, fully compliant, uh, you know, many hundreds of firms. So we've been through that process, you know exactly what how to help you through that. Um, and you actually may find it's already in your engagement letter. Um, it depends on how many iterations of your engagement letter you've had since um, you first, first created it. Sure. Thank you. Uh, another question about, can you charge a percentage of, of the lending to, to the client? Yes, I suppose so, is the answer to that question. So you, <laughs> yes, you can. You, you, we get um, remunerated on a percentage of lending of which we share a large portion of that back with you guys. So you already get a success fee. Um, and we've got certain clients that, um, certain firms that give that all back. We've actually got a full um, kind of uh, 15, 20 minute um, consultation on all your different options um, on charging uh, for funding. So, so some people give all that money that they get from us straight back to the client and then charge success fee themselves. Um, and so there's lots of, that's one of the different alternatives. So I've actually seen some people charge upfront, get a share of the commission and then, then charge success fee as well. Um, so I, I've seen the whole, the whole scale of commercial models uh, used within firms. Um, and so, you know, obviously our job is to guide you to what you think, what the options are. So you, you guys can choose, um, you know, where you believe is the right level for your, for your firm. But I definitely Thanks. believe you should charge because we've seen um, extremely, when, when a firm is not charging, they're not as likely to get that four times success rate as when they're um, charging. Because what actually happens is you become a, a um, kind of advisor of last resort which is not something you want to do. And, and what that means is your client has gone onto Google, done some pretty serious um, applications online, gone around to a whole load of different platforms. And actually the first thing we see when the accountant does the funding search on a platform is that last month there was 30 different lenders who have all put marks on the credit, on the credit bureau data. Um, and that is, when we're looking at the chances of getting a good lending rate and getting to the right lender, that's a very big negative immediately on the first day. So getting to your client before they even think about um, going to the wider market can mean that you can create a much bigger impact for them. Absolutely. So that's that proactive educational approach that, that, that we've been advocating. It's the getting to know your clients. It's the starting to have the conversations. It's about looking at your client base. It's about uh, proactively getting involved in discussions with them to understand where they want to get to, to know whether they're going to need a funding uh, requirement or not, or even just analyzing the numbers you've got and 
quickly approaching the clients to say, you've got a, you've got a cash shortfall. Let's look at how we can help you claw that back, how we can put you in a stronger position. Yeah. Okay, Ollie, I think we don't seem to have any more questions. If you've got any more, do please add them. Do you have any last words, Ollie, you wanted to share? Well, I was just saying, obviously, in our follow-up um, uh, webinar, I'm going to be doing some uh, uh, doing a kind of piece on capital advisory. If you've got any questions before then, uh, please do shout. Um, we'll be happy to answer and incorporate that into the next one. Um, but, you know, please do jump on, um, press the <coughs> um, get funding button within the Clarity platform, or if you come straight to us, please do tell us um, that you're working with um, Clarity and we can make that integration and make our two platforms work as smoothly as this integration um, can do. Um, so I'm excited to start working um, with some of you and helping you to fund your clients. Great, thanks so much, Ollie. Um, yep, I've, I've, I've blabbed enough at, uh, during this web event. I think it's really critical that I suppose to hammer the point home that as accountants, we can do an amazing thing by our small business clients. We've got all the skill sets to be able to do it. And it's about, uh, you know, we, we've been there hammering uh, the, the, the door for the last um, year, helping our clients. This is about doing it for all of our clients and doing it in a way that actually is profitable for the firm, but also is valuable for that small business owner. And again, doing it in a way that makes it makes sense for both parties. So I um, hope you enjoy this uh, first session. Um, why capital advisory and business advisory go together like fish and chips or gin and tonic. I think, uh, I think I could do with a gin and tonic at this stage, uh, certainly. Um, so thank you very much for, for being on and we look forward to seeing you on the 30th of March. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you everyone.